Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this month for Side by Side Digital. I'm your host, Rebecca Shively. We've got a great program lined up for you today. This month, we're talking about crop insurance. You may think of crop insurance as a way to protect yourself from disasters, but crop insurance can also help protect your profits and allow you to be more confident in your marketing decisions. Our experts today are here to walk us through how to use your crop insurance for more than just minimizing your risk. We're joined by two of our regional vice presidents of related services, Amy Housencleaver from Southeast Kansas and Zane Taylor from Southeast Iowa. Amy, Zane, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Amy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Amy Hassenclever. Um, I serve Southeast Kansas, our crop insurance team in Emporia, Kansas, Parsons, Kansas, and Baldwin City, Kansas. Zane Taylor, I'm in Southeast Iowa. Um, so that's Newton, Oskaloosa, and Mount Pleasant. So we have 11 licensed agents down here in Southeast Iowa that we can help, uh, you know, our producers make good sound risk management decisions. And, you know, th that's what this webinar is about, is to talk about risk management. Um, and so we'll just jump right in. Um, you know, like Rebecca said, feel free to chat your questions into the Q&A and we'll, we'll do our best to get those answered for y'all. Um, you know, one of the things about uh, crop insurance is that it is, um, a lot of people think of it as in typical lines of insurance um, where, you know, disaster has to strike and I get paid and it's just something that I put on uh, an insurance policy and I kind of just forget it. You know, if you think of other lines of insurance, whether it's a, you know, a homeowner's insurance policy, a car insurance policy, a lot of times you just put it on the policy, you kind of forget about it unless some sort of accident happens, uh, uh, God forbid, and then you collect on it. Crop insurance is one of those things that is constantly needing to be evaluated and looked at, uh, assessed. And we're going to go through a few concepts of how you could look at your crop insurance policy, how it's more than just a disaster policy. It's really can help you make other decisions in your crop insurance or in your operation, such as like grain marketing. Amy will go through some of that here, uh, kind of towards the end of the presentation. So um, let's jump right in here um, and just kind of identify a few of our concepts that we want to kind of get straight here. Um, the first one is what, what is risk management? And it's, it's pretty simple. It's the process of identifying, monitoring, and managing the potential risks in order to minimize their native, negative impact on your operation. And so, um, you know, it, like I said, it's at a high level, it's really simple. The first, uh, the next slide I'm going to get into is identifying what those risks are. Um, you know, if you are just starting out in farming this year um, or in the last few years, you all are understand that you're faced with unprecedented times. Um, it's interesting. I was at a Casey's uh, general store um, here in Southeast Iowa, whenever the COVID outbreak kind of hit our nation. And uh, there was an 80 year old man that was pumping his gas next to me. And he, he's like, I have never seen anything quite like this. This is incredible. I've been on this earth for, you know, 80 plus years and nothing like this have I ever seen. And it's just interesting that, you know, if, you know, now uh, as the next generation gets into farming, um, things in this world are much more complicated, even um, just five, 10 years ago, um, things were a lot different. And so let's get into some of what are these risks are um, that we may or may not be thinking about. You know, first off, look at some of the export markets today and how volatile these can be uh, year in and year out and day in and day out. Um, you know, I've got a sli slide up here that's showing China. What is China uh, importing? What are we exporting to them? Um, you look at the soybean market, um, you know, China's buying a lot of soybeans from South America um, in, in large part due to the strength of the dollar, the American dollar. And uh, so will that change? Um, you know, it, that has a huge impact of our, our markets here uh, in the United States. Um, COVID is, again, you look at the uh, Omicron variant, uh, regardless of what you think of the variant, it, it does and can have a huge impact on the markets. Uh, the, when the COVID originally came uh, into the United States here, it really disrupted a lot of the markets, um, supply chains. It, you know, 
we're not immune to this yet. Uh, certainly not immune to the disease, but we're not immune to uh, some of the disruptions that COVID um, uh, can, and the impact it can have on our markets. You guys probably know this, cropland values have soared by more than 15%. Our uh, internal appraisers here at Farm Credit um, have been looking at these farm values. Um, they've just been blowing through the roof, blowing the roof off. And uh, that's going to have a huge, huge impact on whether you own land or um, your cash rental rates um, going forward. And, and speaking of input costs, the 2022 crop is looking like it's going to be pretty expensive to put in a crop. And uh, um, you look at a lot of these inputs, such as nitrogen costs, um, fuel, everything has kind of gone up. Inflationary pressures are a very real thing. And um, you know th that's going to have a huge impact on what your risk management plan will look like. Uh, last but not least is the weather, right? That's the big one. And um, we just never know year in and year out what Mother Nature will hand us. And uh, so we really, uh, we really believe that a good risk management plan, uh, certainly a crop insurance policy, is necessary on everyone's operation. So what do I want to talk about a little bit um, here for a second is about what can you control? What can we dictate going into 2022? A lot of times it's fun to talk about what we can't control, all those variables. When I talk to my neighbors, I talk to my friends, we talk weather, we talk input costs, the pandemic. Is it, is it going to be over or is this an endemic that we have to live with? What's, what are the markets doing? What are land prices doing? And, and last but not least, what are grain prices? These are things in large part are out of our control. They, yes, they're fun to discuss and everything. Some of the things that aren't quite as fun to talk about, but are very important are the things that we can control. That's the planning and preparation that we have um, in our operation. How do we manage uh, these controllables? Um, Amy here in a little bit is gonna get into executing, executing some grain marketing sales. How do you use your crop insurance policy to do that? And really what you all are on this call today for is to improve your skill set, improve your competency level, understanding of what risk management really means to you and your operations. So we thank you for being here with us today. Um, we hope that you can use some of these things going forward. So as I go to the next slide here, I want to just kind of lay down um, a concept that if I have a new employee or if I'm talking to a newer farmer, um, let's talk deductibles. What does this really mean from crop insurance standpoint? So I like to use an analogy here and I'm talking about a typical homeowner's insurance policy. If you own a home or any kind of you know, residential property, you understand that there is this deductible, right? That's the skin, your skin in the game. You know, that's what you have to pay before uh, an insurance company actually provides you with an indemnity. So typical insurance policies on, on a house lie somewhere between $1,000 and $2,500, give or take, um, depending on the home value. Crop insurance or multi federally subsidized crop insurance policies typically have much higher deductibles in the form of a percentage. And when you scale this out over a larger number of acres, it'll be a much larger total deductible, which increases the risk profile on your operation. So um, on the next slide here, I'm going to go through an example of how to illustrate this on a larger scale. So say we have a thousand acres on our operation. We've, we've planted all the corn. I'm just going to keep it simple. And I have 185 APH. This is a approved yield history, actual production history, um, which consists of 10 years. I'm not going to get into the detail of that. But then I'm using a 552 futures price on corn. That's December futures for 2022. And I currently have bought an 80% revenue protection policy. The revenue protection policy is going to cover me for both yield and price throughout the year. So if I do the math here, you follow along with me. I've got 185 bushels times that futures price. It, it brings me to this acre uh, per acre valuation. So I got $1,021 per acre that I could expect to see. Now I got to take that times coverage level that I took in which I would have $817. That's my minimum revenue guarantee. So if in any case yield or price drop and it falls below that $817, I'm getting 
paid an insurance indemnity. But then just to kind of show you and illustrate this deductible in a little bit grander scale, if I take that acre valuation times 20%, which is my deductible, I still have a $204 acre per acre insurance deductible that I have to eat through before I get paid. Take that across all my operation, I have over $200,000 that is considered my insurance deductible. So this is what, um, this is an illustration here of just how big and how much that we have to bleed through until we start getting paid. So is there anything we can do about that? You know, a lot of cases, um, you know, you can increase your insurance level, but we really, we encourage you to talk to your farm credit, uh, Services of America, Frontier Farm Credit, agent to see how you could reduce your deductible, reduce your risk profile on that. So, okay, going forward, um, the last presentation that we did last month, the side-by-side -side meeting, we talked a lot about uh, cost of production. And I want to touch on that again, because during that webinar, um, we talked about how powerful cost of production is in deciding on what insurance coverage is uh, that you need. Um, so we believe that knowing your cost of production, you can then make a really sound crop insurance decision. All right, so going forward, I wanna, I wanna talk about how you determine your cost of production. So this is a little bit of a recap uh, segue from the last webinar. So if you remember, we take the total expenses on our operation, you divide that by the units. In this case, we've got 100 acres. That's gonna give you the cost of production. So $860 per acre, okay? So then if I wanna be able to determine what my break even point is, and this will come into play when Amy talks about her grain marketing segment. So I basically divide that cost of production of $860, divide it by how many bushels per acre I could expect, and that's going to give me a break even. And you can see right now, uh, that's 430, which is looks looks like it's very favorable for 2022. If we look at that futures price, um, in, in many cases, we'll be able to start making some forward contract sales um, associated with that break even point. So I just want to pause right there for a second. Those are two things that producers really need to understand before they meet with their crop insurance agent. One, cost of production. Two, is break-even point. And especially, I want to put an emphasis on that cost of production. So now that I've determined what my cost of production is and my break-even point, you can see on this graph, um, that's the point at which if I see higher yield or see higher prices, I'm going to be in a very profitable zone. Um, if prices and or yields fall, then I could be in a shortfall there or uh, an unprofitable situation. So what does that mean for crop insurance? It, it basically means that we are trying to establish a goal each and every year with our producers to secure an insurance policy that can at least cover your break even, if not more. In the example that I have on this slide, we have a producer that has 80% coverage level and that gives them $817 of minimum revenue guarantee. Okay, well that poses a little bit of a problem here because if our cost of production is $860 per acre, that means that I actually have kind of a little bit of a shortfall here in my coverage level. In the next slide, I'll, um, I'll get into what this looks like, the actual numbers behind this. So if, again, if I take that 80% coverage level and it doesn't suffice for my cost of production, I now have a $43 working capital exposure. So in the event that I have um, some sort of natural disaster, any act of God or a market um, decline, um, I would go backwards in this case. So what are my options? I can consider raising the insurance level until break even is achieved. So if I take 80% coverage level today, I could simply 
raise it up to 85% coverage level of revenue protection, which by the way, is the highest level of revenue protection insurance I could take, I could then secure $868 per acre. That's my minimum revenue guarantee. In which case, then you can see we've now um, exceeded our cost of production. We've now, um, quote unquote, have insured for a profit by $8. It gives us a little bit of wiggle room. And um, that's our goal each and every year. Now, not every year works out this way. If we have a year where we have lower prices, um, in some cases, and then higher expenses, um, in some cases, we, we are unable to achieve a break even or above. But this is our goal. This is how we intend on structuring a policy if we can. In a, in a year that we don't, we're unable to achieve that break even or above, um, other things we can do is start stacking on other products, such as crop hail, wind, other supplemental policies that can reduce the risk profile on your insurance policy. Um, something that's still relatively new, um, and we've talked a lot about um, at our Growing On meetings, uh, are the new county-based endorsements. These are shallow loss products like SCO and ECO. These products give the producer the ability to increase their coverage level in up to 95%. And you, saw, you all saw that deductible earlier. This is a really good way to lower that deductible. And uh, it's at a county-based level. So I just encourage you to talk to your crop insurance agent at Farm Credit or Frontier Farm Credit about what those products can mean for you. And just a quick plug on that, um, we do have an upcoming crop insurance webinar on January 18th. Um, we will have those invites going out uh, fairly soon where we'll get into these products in much more detail and you can learn a little bit more in depth on how to lower that deductible for you all and reduce your risk. The thing I would add, Zane, is your multi peril crop insurance is a subsidized product where um, those decisions are unique to each operation. So I would encourage you, as Zane did earlier, to talk to your insurance officer with your farm credit office or Frontier Farm Credit Office to really understand your options as it relates specifically to your uh, operation, as there really is no one size fits all. I'm glad you said that, Amy. I do want to touch on the whole subsidy part of it. Presumably newer farmers, uh, young and beginning on this call, um, me of us probably have heard that, you know, it's a subsidized insurance product and, you know, but really what this means is for every dollar that I put in as a farmer, um, there's another dollar that gets put in uh, to the program. So over the course of time, we could expect to see a positive return on my investment as I buy crop insurance. Typically, those higher levels of insurance are going to, uh, generally speaking, are going to return more money in my pocket over time. Doesn't work that way every year, <laughs> but generally speaking, over the course of time, the more, the higher my level of insurance, I'm going to see more return out of that. So um, I, I, I will address that question in the chat real quick. Um, it, it, the question was, what level of revenue protection, multi peril insurance is most commonly purchased. And Amy, you said, you know, it really is specific to your operation. Um, it really depends where you're at geographically on what those levels of insurance are. So, um, you know, in my area in Southeast Iowa, typically we see the, around that 80% on average. Um, you, you go north some counties and a lot of times you see 85% uh, is very common. Yeah, Zane, I think that's an important piece. It's really dependent on your own operation and, and your area. Um, so it's it's varying to to say say it simply. Well, I will hand it off to you. And Amy is going to talk about uh, some grain marketing decisions, how crop insurance can help you with that. Thanks, Zane. So Zane just spent some time kind of walking through the importance of your cost of production and understanding how that correlates to your crop insurance. I want to spend some time talking about so, so what does that mean for your operation? Because just because you set up a really great crop insurance policy doesn't necessarily 
mean you'll be profitable, right? You got to sell those bushels to be profitable. So how do we have the confidence to do that when the prices are most favorable for us um, without sometimes having those bushels in hand? So, so I want to walk you through a pretty simple example based on some of the numbers Zane showed you earlier um, and kind of walk through the calendar as far as what this might look in this, this very simple example. So again, crop insurance decisions. Zane walked through this these numbers a little bit earlier, but in February and maybe into the early part of March, you're making these decisions based on your cost of production for that year. What makes sense, right? What level of coverage is going to cover my cost of production? So in this case, if you'll remember from the previous slides, Zane talked about an $860 cost of production. So at that 80% level, we're guaranteeing ourselves 148 bushels to the acre, and that's simply taking that APH or that average production history times coverage level. And we take it times that spring price to get that $817 of guarantee at an 80% level. Or, you know, that, that analysis, we can maybe look at that 85% level. So again, the math is the same. Um, your APH times that coverage level of 85% guarantees you 157 bushels and $867 to the acre. So in this case, because our cost of production is 860, we're most likely going to opt for that 85% coverage to, to cover our cost of production, right? So at the end of the day, if we produce zero bushels, there's a hailstorm that comes through and takes out all of our acres, we can cover our input costs. So we'll move forward to March. And it's really important to set marketing goals. Um, there's a lot of emotion that goes on with crop or with crop decisions, right? A lot of, as Zane alluded to earlier, a lot of coffee shop talk, um, a lot of things that come into play. So we would really encourage you to know your cost of production and secure your risk management plan, as we talked about earlier, but then really spend some time setting some marketing goals. We know that written goals drive results. So in this example, our goal is to market 50% of the bushels guaranteed by our crop insurance policy. So as we said in the slide before, we have 157 guaranteed bushels. We're gonna plant 100 acres of corn this year. So that gives me 15,700 guaranteed bushels. If we take that times 50% to figure out what half of our guaranteed bushels are, that gives us 7,850 bushels that we plan on marketing this growing season. When I say that, I mean during the growing season before we harvest these bushels, we're gonna take advantage of summer and growing season spikes in, in, in prices. As a caveat, one thing to remember is we anticipate, even though our um, guarantee is only 157 bushels, we anticipate to grow 200 bushels to the acre to, to give us a total of 20,000 bushels on our corn crop this year. So we set our goals and then we move forward to the next month of April. And um, as we prepare to plant those 100 acres, we notice that the December futures for corn give us a, a 512 price. And so, as you know, basis is a is in play. So we are not necessarily going to get that five twelve. But so we call our local elevator to get the price, and and it's five dollars. So we go ahead and make that first contracting a first contract of twenty thousand bushels to be delivered in December for five bucks. So two thousand bushels times. $5 gives us $10,000 of future sales. Now, remember earlier, we talked about $75,000 being our cost of production or our total expense. We're going to go ahead and subtract that first sale off to get $65,000 of cost of production yet to be covered. So if we, if we calculate, remember earlier, we said $4.30 was our break even. We recalculate excuse me, 375 is our break even. If we recalculate, now we're at a 361 break even with that for sale because we were able to sell some bushels above that break even cost. So we reevaluate and reestablish. And I think that's part of Zane's um, conversation points from earlier is that at every time in, your, in every month throughout the growing season, it gives you opportunities to reevaluate. That's essentially what we're doing when we're reevaluating that break even after that first sale. 
So May rolls around and our 100 acres of corn is planted and it's emerged and we're optimistic about the stand. So on May 5th, we notice that the December futures are above $6. That's pretty exciting. Neighbors are talking about it at the coffee shop. We've heard several people say, man, can we get six bucks? So you call your local elevator and the local bid is $5.90. Still pretty good, right? So um, we Remember, we had that goal early on. We wrote it down that we're gonna mark we're gonna market 7,850 bushels during the growing season. So we pull the trigger on 4,000 more bushels to deliver in December at 590. So again, we do the simple math: 4,000 times 590 gives us $23,600 in our pocket. So again, we subtract that sale off of our remaining expense to understand how much cost of production we yet have to cover. $41,400. So again, we're going to reevaluate our break even at that point and discover that we have a $2.95 break even on the remaining bushels. So we're feeling pretty good, right? That's a good price to have. Amy. Yeah. Yeah. 590. Why would I just limit it to 4,000 bushels? Why would I just do it all at this point? Well, you got a lot of growing season left, Zane. You know, it's May. And if we remember a couple of years ago in Iowa, that derecho event came through when in, in mid-July. So um, I, I think we go back to what we wrote down in March and we make incremental sales. I think our, our marketing experts, as if you went to our growing on uh, meetings, talk about incremental sales through the growing season generally is a good way to do that. Would you have anything else to add, Zane? No, I think that's right. We don't know which way the market's going. Um, this next slide obviously points to the market falls. So, you, you know, in hindsight, you always like, man, I should have sold more the previous month. But to your point, the written plan, um, this is the playbook for the year. And we're sticking to that because, you know, this could be a higher price. Who knows? But this is the example. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. We all want that $6 cash price. But ultimately, understanding your cost of production and your break even and pulling the trigger above that, that that's a win for you. That's money in your pocket. So again, here we are in July. It's our, an opportunity for us we, as we can, as our corn continues to develop, we feel really good about the yield potential. So on July 15th, we noticed a futures price of $5 and 56 cents. So it, it came down a little bit. So again, we're just curious. So we call into our local uh, elevator and get that price of 550. You know, after we evaluate our marketing plan, we realize that we have 1,850 bushels yet to contract to meet our marketing plan. So we go ahead and pull that trigger and we meet our marketing goal of 50% of our insured and guaranteed bushels. So again, simple math, 1,850 bushels times 550 gives us 10,175. Our remaining expenses, 41,400, subtract that third sale off there, gives us $31,225 to cover yet of, of our cost of production. Our reevaluated break even drops to $2.57. Essentially, what that means is at harvest, if we sell those remaining bushels above $2.57, we're in the money. We're making money at that point. So again, we're feeling pretty good. We've done our forward marketing as we wrote our plan back in March. So we roll forward. October, November, December, we've harvested and delivered our crop that we grew. We did produce 200 bushels as we forecasted. Uh, we successfully marketed 50% of our crop insurance guarantee leaving 12,150 bushels unpriced. So we call our local elevator and get the, get the harvest price of $4. Selling those remaining bushels at $4 yields us a last sale of $48,600. We subtract off the remaining costs that we have yet to cover with our, our previous sales to yield a profit of $17,375. You know, that's I, I feel pretty good about that, Zane. If you were growing this crop of 100 acres, would you feel good about a $17,000 profit? Yeah. Yeah. You bet. I and mean, we could beat ourselves all day for not hitting the summer high, but you know, that's, that's great. And that's better than what most will do. Absolutely. So, so you might ask yourself, what if I don't make any future sales? What if, what if I just take that cash price at harvest? So here we put the math out in front of you. So on the left side, you'll see that 200 bushels an acre times hundred acres, that 20,000 bushels to market. 
If you just got four bucks at harvest, you're going to make, make 80,000 total dollars in sales. You subtract off your $75,000 cost of production, you're making $5,000. Or if you simply market 50% of your crop insurance guarantee, folks, that's pretty conservative in the big scheme of things. You're only forward marketing 7,850 bushels of that 20,000 bushels. So, you know, those three sales you made and then taking advantage of that cash price for the rest of your bushels yields a lot more profit to the tune of $12,375 just by making three small incremental sales throughout the growing season. So uh, we wanted to illustrate this because this, this is a pretty conservative approach to marketing. And granted, this example is pretty simple. We're only farming 100 acres, but it kind of gives you an idea of what an impact just a few sales, small sales in the big scheme of things, does to your overall profit. So I know there's a looming question in your mind. What happens if the derecho comes through? We're all way too familiar with that. That has not left our memory um, and, and disaster strikes and wipes out my entire crop. So we forward sold $43,775 worth of crop that we don't have to fulfill those obligations. Think back to your crop insurance guarantee from the beginning of this conversation. We guaranteed ourselves not only 157 bushels to the acre, but also $867 to the acre. So if you do the math, that's $86,700, more than enough to cover those obligations. Now, each grain buyer may have different contracts. So it's on you to figure out how that works in the event that you can't produce those bushels. So that is something that I will say, you need to spend some time understanding what that means for your operation if you can't produce the bushels. But this gives you a great idea of how different your profit could be using a few of those forward sale options. And a lot of people are worried about the forward contracting and, and, you know, selling those bushels. Cause like what, what we're like, I am supposed to physically show up at the elevator with my truck and I'm, I need to haul these to town. And what happens? I don't have the bushels. Do I need to go buy bushels? That's certainly an option. If, you know, the event that we're talking about isn't too widespread and I can't gain access to some bushels or, um, but as you alluded to, in the contract, you know, actually by law, they have to have some sort of a buyout in within the contract. So uh, I, I put an emphasis on checking with your uh, merchandiser, checking with um, the elevator. When you get into the contract, understand what that is. Um, because in many cases, if you don't have any bushels, uh, God forbid, and you have to buy out that contract, you want to know the premium that they're going to charge you for that. And um, you know, that probably brings up a question is like, why 50%? You know, why, why do I market 50% of my bushels? Is it, you know, why is it not 24? Why is it 75? Why is it, why not a hundred percent of my bushels that I have guaranteed? Amy, do you want to talk about that at all? Sure. Sure. I think that's a good question to ask Zane. And, and I think it, it, it really comes down to this you need to start somewhere, right? And, and going 100% probably isn't the right way to start it, but I would say um, talk to your crop insurance agent, talk to your farm credit um, insurance specialist and understand, you know, where do I start on this? How, how can I get, in, get to capture more of that revenue, revenue to make me more profitable, right? So I, again, there's probably not a one size fits all answer to this one either, uh, but um, doing something versus doing nothing, I think, is is the best way to approach this. Yeah, we've always held the stance that theoretically you can in, um, contract or contract 100 percent of your APH. I'm not suggesting you do that. Uh, we always want to be very conservative with that, um, you know, somewhere in the 50 to probably 75 percent range. The reason being is if, you know, there's really twofold. Number one, if you have a, to buy out your contract, there's a premium associated with that. Um, you know, if you have some positive basis um, in the market, um, you know, that could uh, definitely kind of put you upside down. So we don't recommend that you um, for contract 100% of your guaranteed bushels, um, but start with a share of that. And I think 50% is conservative especially with young and beginning farmers, um, until you feel more comfortable 
with um, a, a higher percentage, but start there and then and then work your way into it to some higher percentages. Yeah, and saying when you say 50%, I would add that's 50% of your crop insurance guarantee, not necessarily 50% of your 10 year history or your average, but it's a good place to start. So Absolutely. as we move forward, so what can we do to reduce our risk? First and foremost, I think it's important to understand your cost of production. That's really the foundational piece. And your risk management plan can be built on top of that. Your grain marketing can be incorporated into that. But without a solid understanding of that cost of production, both of those two other variables, your crop insurance and your marketing decisions, are really founded on, on some pretty shaky, uh, pretty shaky foundation. So um, know what your minimum guaranteed bushels are. Know, know how many bushels you have potentially to market. Um, consider making those incremental sales, execute that plan that you, and, and I really, I really recommend writing those plans down. A writ, written plans do drive results. To Zane's point earlier, control what you can control. You're here today. That's a good first start. Working on that skill set is important, but focus on those things that you do have control on. There are so many variables that we don't, so it's a good reminder to focus there. And last but not least, visit with your uh, Farm Credit Services of America or Frontier Farm Credit Insurance Officer and really have a discussion about your operation and what makes best sense for you in your operation. Thanks, guys. Really great information. It does look like we have a couple questions that have come through. The first one is, how many different insurance companies does FCA represent and how do agents determine which company fits a producer best? Do you have a specific example? So just globally, uh, our association has, I believe, a contract with six, six different um, approved insurance providers. We vet the list of insurance providers year in and year out to determine whether or not we make um, any changes. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that go into determining what insurance providers that we utilize, anything from financial backing to be able to pay the claims that are out there, you know, how many adjusters, what kind of capacity do they have? There's a lot that goes into those decisions. And then if you look at more locally, for instance, the region that I lead, we do business with two different insurance companies that we feel have good reputation, have adjusters that can service all the claims and things like that, and basically service the needs of our producers. To give you, I think the question was specific examples of you know, how we might choose an insurance company. There are some insurance companies that are better equipped to deal with like precision farming, whether it's the collection of yields or, or uh, GPS acres. Some insurance companies are really good about that, that data source. And uh, we might choose a certain insurance company that fits best with the producer's needs. There's also different product, private product lines that are available for producers. So when we look at products such as like crop hail or wind, there's also supplemental policies that you can layer on top. Um, some of those products are a little bit different from each insurance company. So it kind of just depends on what fits the producer's needs. And that's how we decide on which insurance companies to use. But I guess from a standpoint here in Southeast Iowa, I don't know, Amy, if you have any other thoughts on that. The, the only thing I would add, Zane, is that this really becomes a producer decision based on the, the approved insurance providers that are utilized in that area. Um, and, and it's it's we have a different blend in the area that I serve. We, we write with three different approved insurance providers. Um, that said, uh, I don't think that they're, they, they all are governed by RMA, follow the same rules and regulations, have the same adjustment manual. Um, so I don't know that there necessarily is a wrong answer for what um, AIP um, you decide to go with. Great. Thanks for that explanation. We did have another one come through. Um, the crop insurance guarantee doesn't cover your marketing obligations and your cost of production, correct? How do you address both crops? That's assuming you have no crop to harvest. Your cost of production, depending on when you you decide your, your cost, you're not harvesting that cost. For example, if it's a drought and you plan it and you don't have much stand, you're probably not going to um, put a 
fungicide on it. You're, you're probably not going to do a lot of the cost that you had anticipated early on. So your cost of production will adjust. I think the biggest thing to remember there is as you're going through that calendar year, keep in mind that you're going to recalibrate your cost of production and your decisioning as you go. And you're going to make the best decisions based on that operation at that point. Zane, what would you add? Yeah, and I'm trying to interpret the question. I think that, uh, you know, so if you're going to be buying yourself out of the contract and there's going to be a premium that you pay, you know, let's just give an example. It might be five to 10 cents a bushel to buy yourself out of the contract. Um, since you don't have delivery of that, those bushels, um, you're going to just be paying the premium on that. For instance, like if you were to afford contract certain percentage, like Amy went through the examples, assuming you're going to get, I think the numbers were $45,000 in your pocket and you, well, you're not going to show up with that. Uh, so the $45,000, you know, you're basically going to be just paying the premium on that. So hopefully, hopefully that addresses that. I mean, you yeah, you still got to account for your cost of production, all the expenses, but you're also going to be paying probably a premium to the elevator to just buy yourself out of the contract. It's not going to be, you're not going to be paying the elevator, say five, six bucks a bushel. It's just a premium associated with that. I'm not sure if that was the question. Uh, I'm not sure if I addressed that right, uh, Rebecca, but um, certainly have a follow-up if, if we didn't address that right. Yeah, sounds good. We definitely have a couple more minutes here for um, additional questions. Uh, another one that came through in terms of cost of production, if I'm not currently doing this, do you have any advice on the best way to get started? Will my financial officer help me? How do I kind of get going on this? And along with that, what's a good cadence for updating that? You talked about continually recalibrating that. Is there a good rule of thumb? Um, quarterly, monthly, daily, any advice that you guys have around that? I'll, I'll start and then say, and I'll ask for your commentary as well. But I, I think to answer that last question, um, the more frequent, the better, right? So think about your own personal goals. And um, if, if you want, to, if you're wanting to um, have a fitness goal, the more frequently you visit those goals and recalibrate, the better off you are or a weight loss goal. But um, as a general rule of thumb, I, I think you're okay to think about that in terms of monthly, right? Um, but you know, with as volatile as the markets can be, you might want to do it more frequently based on what futures prices are doing and, and take a look at that initial goal. And, and if, if there's an opportunity in the example that we showed, like the second sale, you may adjust your plan at that point and sell up to your entire marketing goal at that point, if you feel that that's where the high is of that growing season. So I, I think to, to that point, you're going to continually uh, reestablish and reevaluate those goals as you go forward. Um, but I think a regular cadence of at least monthly is an important starting point. Yeah, I think that makes sense, Amy. As far as cost of production, there are a variety of tools out there that you can, uh, you know, we've had some tools, spreadsheets, uh, things that you can use to go through all your costs. Um, you know, historically, I've, I always look at like Iowa State uh, Ag Decision Maker to kind of look at, you know, generally speaking, uh, where I'm at, what is the cost of production looking like? Am I in line with those? And that, you know, those type of resources can help you make sure that you're not missing any kind of expenses out there. We always encourage our producers to look at their, you know, put their family living into their cost of production because, you know, that return to ownership and return to family living is a big part of the expense of the operation. And we just encourage you to try to think through all the things, the expenses that you're going to have and do your best to, um, and you're not going to be spot on more than likely because cost do evolve throughout the year. You know, you might have bought a, a fraction of, you know, your nitrogen costs, and then you buy have bought some later. So when you make those new purchases, those new expense purchases, then that's when you want to update it as well. So I think monthly is good, Amy, I, but also as you make those purchases and expense changes, make sure to update that um, cost of production in the break-even point. Great. Really good advice there. Um, it looks like we're out of questions and we're also out of time. It seems like our time together just flew by. Um, but I want to say thank you to Amy and Zane again for being here today um, and answering all of our questions and walking us through the scenario. I think a really great thing to think about as we head into the new year and think about goal setting in general, and especially how we want to set up for success and success in our operations. Um, so thank you and the audience for being with us today and for your great participation in questions. And we will be back next month on February 2nd, Groundhog Day. We'll be joined by a special 
guest, market analyst, Elaine Cub. Elaine's going to give us her 2022 outlook. So until then, um, take good care and we hope to see you online again next month.